Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Meet the Authors. Mary Roach, Glory Edom, Lon Samantha Chang. What a group. I'm Donna Seaman, Booklist Adult Book Editor. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience, that's you, is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along any other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you. Also, Booklist will now be offering closed captioning on all our webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcripts icon on the toolbar. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions by selecting subtitle settings at any time. Last but not least, links to today's slides and a title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom an hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom and click on the link. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. And now, oh yes, today we have the pleasure of hearing from Lon Samantha Chang, Glory Edom, and Mary Roach. So today we begin, oh, let me see, where is my, we begin with Sam, sorry, no, it's in, out of order. Sam is the author of the award-winning books, Hunger, Inheritance, All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, and Big News, a new novel to be published by Norton in February 2022, The Family Chow. Lon Samantha Tang is a recipient of the Wallace Stegner and Truman Capote Fellowships at Stanford University. Sam has also received a Guggenheim Fellowship and from the Iowa Writers Workshop, a Teaching Writing Fellowship and a Michener Copernicus Fellowship. Sam lives in Iowa City, Iowa, where she directs the prestigious University of Iowa Writers Workshop. We're so excited about your new book. We're so thrilled that you're here. Welcome, Sam. Hi, it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk today to everyone about my book. Um, i very excited, a little nervous. Um, it's been a long time since I've published a book. This one um, took me 15 years really to write and it started like so many of my work, um, my work start in childhood. Um, I was the child of immigrants in a striving and crowded house in Appleton, Wisconsin. I was a reader. Um, I was the third of four sisters and the four of us, plus my mother, my grandmother and my father lived together in a small three bedroom house in Appleton, Wisconsin. And this childhood that I had had made this powerful impression on me as everyone's childhood does it. But I'm not so sure that everybody spends the rest of their life trying to figure out how to communicate what it was like. Um, I, it was a house where we had no money. Um, we had a ton of ambition. You know, we were immigrants. We came to this country because my parents um, wanted to make a good lives for us here. As you know, on the flip side of that, there was a lot of disappointment. Um, and temperamentally, we were loud. We laughed a lot. We were annoyed with each other. We yelled at each other a lot. Um, it was just a very, very particular house lots of lots of warmth and um just a really powerful sense that we were all in it together um as i said i was a bookworm i spent a lot of time at the appleton public library um and i it, there was a big moment when i graduated to the adult section um and what i remember about that is sort of looking to see which books looked the most important. It's sort of a um, mysterious language that a you know, kid who doesn't know very much about libraries can see from looking at just the way that books sit on the shelves or how many people have read them or how old they look. Um, the 
books that I noticed particularly as a child were classics. And as an, as a sort of growing child, I became completely interested in what, um, what was there on the shelves in the adult library. And of course I found um, Dostoevsky there. Uh, I certainly don't think I would have learned about him in my classes or at home because because generally I was in a period where people weren't really teaching or reading Dostoevsky. And after I became a writer, I realized that most people weren't writing in the style of Dostoevsky either. Um, meanwhile, I'm growing up and becoming a writer and I, I found myself searching for a voice and form that could tell the story of the house I grew up in. You know, where was that voice? I, I looked a lot at um, Jewish writers of post-World War II. So, Kayam Potak, uh, Philip Roth. There was a lot of sort of um, angst and suffering of uh, immigrant families that I could completely relate to in these books. And I think in my first book, Hunger, it was really about immigrant suffering. It was about trying to tell a story of people whose, whose hopes for America and for themselves as humans, as family members didn't quite come to pass. And then oftentimes were, you know, brutally disappointing. Um, I did feel when I was writing my book that I wanted to recreate what it was like to grow up in the house where I did. But I always knew that something was missing. I remember writing a scene where the daughter and the, the father are fighting about whether she gets to go out on a date, which was basically something that happened constantly when I was growing up with my three sisters and my extremely strict parents. Um, and I remember thinking, yeah, they're, they're, they're upset with each other, but really what they should be doing is screaming at each other. Like, how do you create that in literature? It just didn't exist in the books that I was reading. Um, and then at some point, um, I remember, you know, as going on as a writer and teacher, it was some time ago, 15 years ago, I was working with the student who was a Russian literature major. And we started talking about the brothers Karamazov. And I thought, I need to reread this book. And I reread the book and, and sort of came to a realization that the reason they don't teach Dusty Yessi in writing class is that he breaks all of the rules that he's supposed to be, follow, you know, that writers are supposed to follow. So, for example, I remember one of my teachers telling me, do not use exclamation points. You are allowed to use two exclamation points in your entire life. Um, and here he was, here's a writer who's the characters, practically every sentence that comes out of their mouth feels like it has either an invisible exclamation point or depending on the translator, a real one. Um, the, the book also had a ton of humor in it and humor and suffering go hand in hand, but so rarely can, can it be, I mean, is it is it shown, I think, in, in literary fiction and, and then the, the, also, the, the book um, was just full of, of crudeness, which to me seems like a very big part of life as well. And I think, I think one of the things that really struck me um, when I was thinking about trying to write about what it was like to grow up um, the way I did was that this required more than a quiet storyline. If you have a, an, an ex an exclamatory voice. You want some kind of story that's strong enough to carry it along. It requires a plot. And that was the other thing that really um, appealed to me uh, in the book I read, The Brothers Karamazov, which is essentially a mystery and trial book that shows all the events coming up before the mysterious death of the father, before um, the first half. And then in the second half, we learn the consequences and we um, try to understand who was responsible for this death. And I realized that somehow there was a wonderful scaffolding for the story that I wanted to tell, the story of immigrant characters um, in, in a family that was just filled with life and also filled with the possibility of death. Um, because one of the fascinating things about coming to this country uh, from another place is the knowledge that you're leaving behind so much of who you are. And that if you don't succeed in the life that you have planned for yourself here or dreamed for yourself here, that you're essentially you know, going to extinguish everything that you have been. And I think that that um, 
powerful sense uh, has been sort of underlying everything that I can remember about growing up with my parents. And now I think that my parents, you know, now that my parents have both passed away, I think that this uh, sort of the desire to capture what it was that we all experienced together and what my family will never experience again became really powerfully important to me. So pretty much that's, that's the, the genesis of my book. It came out of reading and it came out of being a child of a Chinese family in the Midwest. And I think I'll, it's, it's subject matter that I'll probably return to um, as I continue to see, uh, as I get a little older, what I went through as a child from more and more directions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sam. Fascinating, we'll talk more. Mary Roach. Mary is the author of six best-selling works of nonfiction, including Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, Gulp, Adventures on the Elementary Canal, and most recently, Grunt, The Curious Science of Humans at War. Mary's writing has also appeared in Outside, National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine, among other publications. Her new book is Fuzz, when nature breaks the law. It's out from Norton at September 21. And here's a scoop. There's going to be a starred review in book list. Congratulations and welcome to Mary Roach. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I, that's very, very exciting. And especially coming from book list, because I'm a huge fan and supporter of libraries. I basically was raised in a library because my father was 65 when I was born. So he's retired. He's like, I'm the childcare guy. What do I do? So he takes her, I'll take her to the library. So he would like park me in the children's section and then go off to murder, crime and biography, which were the places he went to in the library. I can still picture the little signs. The murder one had like a dripping dagger, which as a child was kind of fascinating, but frightening. Um, so essentially the library was my daycare center. So um, it, that's, I'm, I'm so gratified to hear that. Thank you. So uh, my new book, uh, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, uh, it's essentially, it's a book about um, human wildlife conflict. That is, um, what do you do about bears breaking and entering and raiding people's refrigerators? What do you do about jaywalking deer? What do you do about millions of blackbirds that uh, on their way north or south uh, stop to raid the sunflower fields of North and South Dakota. Um, you can't find them, you don't arrest them. Although in centuries past, in fact, that was done. Uh, they're just animals being animals. So what, what can we do and um, what should we do? And uh, science has some answers and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Uh, I, I like to step into a world that I know nothing um, about. And this was certainly that. Um, uh, I spent time with uh, people with titles I did not know existed, like um, human elephant conflict specialist, um, danger tree faller blaster, um, bear manager. These, were, these are people whose lives are dedicated professionally to trying to resolve these conflicts, conflicts figure out ways to deal with them and even better than that ways to prevent them um so i spent uh as but with all of my books i like to uh I, I like to travel to different destinations it kind of makes things a little more interesting and in this case different perspectives on what you might do in these situations i spent time in india in um, small towns in the himalaya where leopard attacks are um, a surprisingly common event also elephant human conflicts in, in um, agricultural villages in the north of India. And then the famous <clears throat> mugging macaques of Delhi. I was actually, um, I was mugged by a macaque, uh, by two macaques, in fact, at the same time. Um, uh, I was in New Zealand, I was uh, at the Vatican. I try, to, I try to choose places and settings that one wouldn't expect. I mean, you would expect me to be somewhere where there, there's bears and the back alleys at 3 a.m. where, uh, and I did that in uh, Aspen, Colorado, but um, I heard about these gulls that on, um, when the Pope was about to uh, 
do Easter mass outside in St. Peter's Square at like four in the morning, these gulls would come swoop down and destroy the floral arrangement. And this is a massive floral arrangement with tens of thousands of daffodils and roses. And then like just before the Pope's gonna come in, these birds came in and just sort of wreaked havoc. And so I was like, what was going on? What could we possibly do? So I thought, well, I definitely need, I need to report on that. I need to go to the Vatican. So, uh, so there's a chapter set there. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of what the book is, I don't know what the book is about. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I was gonna. I guess that's. I guess that's sort of a good summary. I don't know how I'm. I'm. I've got a little more time. Um, I, I can tell you also that um, while I was uh, while I was in Rome, I thought, well, um, maybe I should try to ask the Pope <laughs> what he thinks should be done about because Saint, you know. Um, Francis is, is named, you know, he's, his, his guy is St. Francis, who was a, a friend of the animals, a, a supporter of the poor. And I thought, well, maybe they're sexually, he's got some things to say. So I, I had this really naive idea that I would set up an audience with the Pope. <laughs> that didn't happen. However, I did score an interview with the, um, the Pontifical Academy for Life, who are kind of the ethicists of the Vatican. Um, and so I have this chapter where I sit down with one of their the Vatican ethicist. So I think kind of didn't really know what I was there for. And it was, it's a, a kind of a, um, a bizarre uh, afternoon, but that, you know, that's in the book as well. Um, and I did while I was there, uh, but they didn't really know what to do with me. So they took me on a little tour and they thought I was kind of a, a, a nature person. So they went to show me, um, it's the Pope's compost heap. It was this massive pile of grass clippings and garbage. So I saw um, the papal compost heap. I didn't make it to the Vatican Museum like most people, but I did see the papal compost heap. So that was pretty exciting for me. Anyway, um, I think I'll turn it over to, um, I guess it's Glory next, right? Right. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Well, more to be told, surely. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Glory Adam. Glory is the founder of Well-Read Black Girl, a book club and digital platform that promotes Black literature and sisterhood. Glory won the Innovators Award at the 2017 Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Well-Read Black Girl, Finding Our Stories, Discovering Ourselves. That was her first book. Her new book, her new anthology is On Girlhood, 15 Stories from the Well-Read Black Girl Library, which will be, present, will be published by Live Right in October, 2021. Congratulations and welcome, Glory. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and discuss On Girlhood. Thank you for that warm introduction, Donna. Um, this book is so special to me. As Donna mentioned, this is my second anthology, and it really is focusing on the lens of Black girlhood through short story and finding, really looking at coming of age stories. Um, during 2020, and even before that, I was doing a deep dive of looking at what the word girl meant in the title, Well-Read Black Girl. And I was revisiting my library and thinking about all the stories that helped really form my perspective and just my, um, my identity in a lot of ways. And I kept coming back to short stories. I kept coming back to the original writings of Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and even Rita Dove, there were so many great authors that really influenced how I saw the world. And I wanted to put them all in one beautiful curated collection to let the reader understand how I've been able to, you know, really develop my um, philosophy for Well-Read Black Girl. If you're unfamiliar with the organization, I started in 2017. Um, the festival started in 2017, and then the organization itself started in 2015. And we really have been looking at um, Black womanhood through literature, reading and reflecting on the works of Black women and how it makes a difference in the lives of everyday people, but also uh, how it impacts the literary canon. And this anthology for me really feels like something for a new generations of readers. Um, we are so fortunate 
to have the only short story written by Toni Morrison to be in this collection, as well as stories from luminaries such as Edgewich Dandy Cat and as Zornio Hurston. It feels like a not only like an anthology, but a beautiful keepsake, something that you can revisit and think about your own library and how to expand it. So I have so many references and books that I keep close to me at all times. This is my absolute favorite book here, Black Women Writers. Um, and it's written by Mari Evans, uh, as well as you know the iconic Thor Neil Hurston, Their Eyes Are Watching God. Uh, these aren't short, story, short stories per se, but they definitely influenced how I decided to curate this book and how I was looking at what it means to be a young person, a young Black girl to be um, exact during this time. You know, like we continue to move forward and there's so many different movements that are happening. And I was, you know, I'm thinking of Black Lives Matter. I'm thinking of just, you know, the fight towards equality, the conversations we're having about anti-racism. All these monumental things are happening in society, but they still go back to the very beginning of young people, what young people are thinking about, the nuance they bring to conversation, the messiness, the imperfections. And I was able to see like these beautifully crafted sentences in the work of Dorothy West and of Alice Walker. And they, although, you know, decades and time is changing, those questions of belonging and intimacy and vulnerability always exist. And I was just like so taken by how, despite the decade, those questions still linger and they still deserve to be answered and really um, investigated. And so this anthology is my attempt to do that investigation and to look at how um, young people are, you know, changing and growing and how we can like really look back at history and see how these authors have offered us a blueprint of sorts. Uh, so uh, I'm really proud of the collection. I'm really like, it was so amazing to go back and really like read all these short stories and be immersed in them in a new way um, and think about how we can go about when we say the words like diversity and inclusion, how these things can be executed through literature and how we can have really profound conversations around how, um, how, I mean, how this work just impacts everyone, every reader at every stage of their life. So yes, we're focusing on black girls, but this book is li literally for everyone. It, they, these stories of words deserve to be in everyone's library. And in my introduction, I give so much praise to all the libraries that I have gone to over the years and the corners that I like hidden and the stacks and just being curious and you know throw back to the card catalogs that were yellow and faded that you had to flip through um and I think that kind of just like digging in and being hidden in a library is still so needed and so deserved like yes we have zoom and we can talk this way it's awesome but libraries they're just they're just magic. They're magical portal portals for us. They allow us to be our best selves. They allow us to just like go on a treasure hunt to discover something new. So I hope this book for the readers will be just new treasures, new discoveries, and just like new titles and books to add onto your bookshelf. And I hope when you read one story, you'll be excited to look up their whole catalog. Like if you read the one story by Dorothy West, you'll want to go read every single work that she has done. Um, and also, I mean, you know, I'm naming all these incredible like luminaries that most people know, but there's also new contemporary writers that I've been able to feature, folks that have been part of the Well Read Black Girl Book Club, um, like uh, Camille Acker, her story in here, it's like such a powerful punch. Um, Alexia Authors, who's an incredible author, who has a just a, a, a story that will just take you, sweep you off your feet. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much to say and I'm excited to be here. I'm so honored to be part of this conversation, to be talking with Lon and Mary and Donna. Like this is, for me, just is the best part of bringing a new book into the world. It's just to share my enthusiasm and excitement around it and encourage folks to do that same, um, 
that same treasure hunt of like reading and being excited. So thank you again for having me. And I'm excited for the second portion of this conversation where we can like really like dig deep into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Gloria. That was wonderful. My library loving heart is just lifted by all of you talking about how important libraries are to you. Um, I do believe there are no writers without them first being readers. And for, I think, all of us here, certainly today, libraries are the source of that. So thank you. Thank you so much for your presentations and lots to talk about. I'm going to go uh, start with the order that you appeared. So I will start with Sam. And Sam, I haven't read much of your book yet. It's very early, but I was looking through the description and uh, you described your home life as an inspiration in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, but I believe the family Chow is anchored to a family restaurant. And I wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about that because it immediately made me think of how food is so intrinsic to family, so much part of cultural identity and in small towns restaurants are important. Sure. I mean, the restaurant, the restaurant was inspired by my mom, who arrived as a very young woman in the middle of the Midwest in a many, many years ago, maybe 1965, she moved to Appleton. And she and my dad were one of the only Chinese families in this town. And they, there were no restaurants for Chinese people. And they immediately started trying to figure out how to make the food that they wanted to eat with ingredients that they had like zero relationship to. So like even something like watermelon in, um, in China, the watermelons are not red. So she would open a watermelon and be like shocked by the bright color. They're kind of a yellow color in Asia. So, so everything they, they encountered in the grocery store was exotic, you know, tons of potatoes around here. Um, ground beef, you know, like anything seemed pretty wild, but yet they were trying to put together these dishes that they had, you know, loved and grown up with and needed to have in order to feel at home and to make themselves feel competent, you know, that they could cook themselves a meal. And so there, there was a lot of sort of driving to Chicago for supplies because there were zero supplies in grocery stores at that time. There's no tofu. They tried to make tofu by themselves from um, like local soybeans. Like they used, like they cooked them up and then they used like a, um, a mixer for cakes and things to try to mix them into like a blend, a batter. And they burned out like multiple mixers. I just remember them constantly running this test kitchen in our house, you know, growing stuff in the garden and trying to make it spicy enough, which they did succeed in that particular way. Um, I mean, there was this one, cause my grandmother was with us and she was really anchored to Asian cuisine, she and my dad. So um, she would she would grow these these um, peppers that she had found somewhere, and, you know, and brought to Wisconsin, and then cook them into the sludge that was so like hard to breathe when she was cooking that we would all flee from the kitchen, and she'd be like coughing away over the stove. And I was just I was sort of inspired by the idea of like, what if this restaurant were to arrive in a situation like this? and try to figure out what the Americans want and didn't want to eat. And, and then actually my mother had a list um, in her recipe file box that said what Americans like, what Americans don't like, because she was trying to cook for my dad's coworkers and stuff. Um, and yeah, so I pretty much, I, I pretty much wanted them to have a restaurant. It also figures heavily in the plot. The restaurant is a big part of the plot. But, but the fact that it's a restaurant, I mean, it could have been any business, I suppose, but it needed to be a restaurant because I just wanted to think about food and think about the food that I grew up on. Um, I mean, I don't know. I always found American food, American food, quote unquote, um, to be like incredibly exotic when I was a kid because we ate Chinese food all the time. So mashed potatoes, like my dream. And I still love mashed potatoes. Uh, anyway, so that's why we're in a restaurant, really. Love that. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so Mary, when Sam was talking about what's exotic and what's not, I was thinking about your brief turn to animals. And I, I don't think of you as like, I think of you as very human centric as a, as a science writer. So what was it like to enter the animal world? How did you feel? Yeah, well, I had, I, I kind of reached this point where I thought I've, I've used, I've sort of used up all the body parts 
<laughs> I mean, I've done the alimentary canal. I've done the dead bodies. I've done the sexual parts. And I was like, I've run out. <laughs> so um, I, I kind of had to, to look elsewhere. And, uh, and I, I, like anybody, I, I find animals fascinating and very appealing. Um, I, I, the thing about animals, they're not very quotable. <laughs> so um, I, I, they're also a very, they're, they're, they're so visual. Um, you almost want to just sort of play the video, you know, take a video and just show that. So um, uh, it was, it was a really fun challenge, a new challenge for me to describe, say, you know, I was at one point in this back alley behind a bunch of restaurants in Aspen at three in the morning. And if you go at three in the morning to those back alleys, you will probably encounter bears uh, and just, just um, watching them and, and trying to describe them in a way that's not, you know, not overly anthropomorphizing, but also capturing just how freaking cute they are, but also the heartbreak of knowing these bears are getting too comfortable around people. They're, you know, they're, they're going to end up in trouble or dead. And, and that's heartbreaking. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, bears, they're so cute. Uh, so there was a whole set of um, different challenges for me as a, as a reporter and writer. But ultimately, it was, you know, very fun uh, and, and just something new. And that's great. Well, we'll come back around because, of course, people are, were part of your story as you were describing in your presentation. Um, all the all the animal lovers and animal fixers, yeah. whatever they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah ultimately, it's a it's a book about humans as much or more than the animals. Yeah, yeah, can't get away from the people. Um, so, Glory, <laughs> I guess I'll start with you um, and just to ask you a little more about the concept of girlhood um, as, a, as a universal theme that inspired you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was 2020 again, I was looking at my bookshelf endlessly, like we weren't leaving the house. So books, my personal library became the guide for me for all of this. And I think that, you know, the word girls can, can be, um, it, it's used in so many different ways. When I'm talking to my girlfriends, it's like, hey girl, how are you doing? And then when you think of girl as a young girl, the formative years of becoming yourself and growing, um, and then thinking of um, the the playfulness of the term and just how there's, there's just so many forms of what the word girl means and how it can be uh, shared in the world. And I think for me, I was like really trying to narrow it down. So I mentioned earlier, like the sentences, like really looking at the sentences very carefully as I was reading the the short stories is to, to really decipher what the author was trying to communicate and what that like the unspoken language of girlhood is and the mystery behind it and just like the longing and desire a lot of the stories uh for me feel really imperfect in this like the best kind of way because there's not uh any kind of performance behind it there's no pretense it just feels really organic and um and it reminded me as of a as of me as a young person trying to figure it out, you know. And I think that there's something really beautiful that happens in the short story because there's so much brevity to it, and it requires you to be concise and really figure out what you're trying to communicate to the reader versus a, a novel or like a more long form, like you know, you're going through the motions with the the person and really following the story and the plot and the characters. And with a short story, it's like just a few pages, you know? So um, I, I like that. I like that kind of, and it really puts the, the onus on you to figure out the agency of the character and even within yourself. Uh, so I, I think that was what really sparked my curiosity. And um, it's really how I approach all books in a lot of ways. Like I'm very curious about what the author is trying the end game for them like what are they really trying to say and also what are they not saying that's also communicating something if that makes sense like there's just all these like unspoken things that happen in writing and so many things uh, that are like left on the cutting room floor that um that can you know change the the mood of the story or just like have the interpretation and when it once it goes out there and i have uh, so many different ideas of girlhood because of my upbringing and my own lived experience, you know, 
yes, I'm, you know, I'm black, I'm a black woman, um, but I'm also first generation. My parents are Nigerian. I'm also um, someone who feels very fluid in the world and all these things come up in my identity. And I was looking for those kind of reflections in these stories. And I, it was a really eye-opening experience. And this for sure is not, um, all of the stories it feels like just a small snippet there's only 15 beautiful stories in here but there can be so so many more that, i mean this could be 30 40 50 100 stories but i i had to narrow it down to these 15 i'm really proud of them and i think they do like start that conversation and at the end of it i do have like a further reading guide because i think like you should continue to really dig through and add all these beautiful tales to your own personal library yes thank you so much there are so many recommendations and, and real surprises in there and, and some beautiful classics too along with like girl by jamaica kincaid oh my god yeah you can read that story a hundred times and <laughs> it's always great <laughs> so thank you glory um, Sam, I'm, we have a question from the audience, and this was something that I was really struck by as, as well, as, about the coexistence of suffering and humor um, mm -hmm. and, and bringing that to literature, that um, humor is such a survival tactic, and it's hard to write funny. It's actually very difficult, and um, it's interesting that you detected humor in The Brothers Karamazov, which, you know, is a very bloody crime tale. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk some more about that symbiosis. I just think that book is so funny. I mean, that the, the reason it's funny is that the, of the character, um, Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, the father, he's just completely politically incorrect. And even though we're talking about 19th century Russia, it was politically incorrect in 19th century Russia. You know, like everything he says, he turns into a dirty joke. He can't, he can't stop. Um, he, he's a, he calls himself a buffoon. And in that way, I mean, a buffoon is one of the central figures of a comic novel. And so is a holy fool, for example, in a, com a fool in a comic novel. And so I just couldn't help trying to, couldn't help noticing um, that there was a container big enough to com contain like elements of my own father who, you know, he just died at, in March of 2020, but he was born in, you know, he's, he was 97 when he died. He went through so many revolutions. You know, he went through the Cultural Revolution, the Revolution of 49 before that. And then, you know, before that, he was in the middle of a, a very big changing society. And he came to this country. Um, I, he, just, he just had a personality larger than life. Like, he was just so extraordinary. And I think one of the reasons that I had trouble with realism, like quiet realism, which is what I was writing, by the way, and teaching, by the way, for so many years, is that I don't think it encompasses all of life. And that on some level, that the experience of encountering another culture or moving through culture is inherently comic. And as they say, comedy is tragedy, speed it up. So there's just a lot, um, there's a lot blended together in the book that I feel like I couldn't quite figure out until I um, reread and re-encountered this book. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a conversation with the book. Obviously it's a contemporary book, it, um, but, but, but I think there's a lot there. Um, I also think that uh, there's, there are different kinds of humor. There's slapstick humor, there's irony, there's you know, the, the, the kind of humor that requires um, you know, clever intellect or puns, you know, this kind of thing. And I, I feel like Dostoevsky was, was mostly um, able to just create this largeness um, but I also think that part of the humor in his, in his novel is that there were, there were sort of comedy of manners elements to it. The narrator in the Brothers Karamazov is, is a first person narrator. He's a member of the town, the small town in which all of the events of the book take place, but he's also an omniscient first person narrator in that he seems to see everything and know everything that's happening. And he also has a kind of distance on everything that's happening, a social distance. Like sometimes it sounds like a polite social distance, but it ends up being quite funny. And um, I was interested in this idea of a community narrator when I was writing this book. And although I decided to avoid trying to write a first person omniscient, 
Um, I do have a, a voice that moves in a somewhat kaleidoscopic way from point of view to point of view throughout. And I think that also creates a, like a, a bigger sense, a bigger camera, which is part of the element of making something funny. Like it's funny when you can see it from slightly far away. Something incredibly depressing when seen from far away can have elements of humor in it. And that some of the saddest things, for example, some of the desires of the, this family and the things that they want and are not going to have, in particular, the second brother in this, um, in this novel is just, he's got these really powerful ambitions um, and he just can't see what's sitting right in front of his face. Um, but you can see it because you're a little further away from him as the reader. Um, anyway, that, those are just some of the, the some of the ways in which I found myself really engaged by uh, the presence of humor in this story. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for asking. That's fascinating. And you know, I'm always astonished at the complexity of novels and short stories as well. As Lori was saying, how much? Yeah, goes I on love in short fiction? stories. Glory, I'm a big fan of Alexia Arthur. I just want to. I'm so thrilled that you included Alexia Arthur's work in your anthology. It's a yeah, it's a great lineup, really. Um, so, Mary, to you, humor. I mean, you talk about yeah. some very complicated <laughs> things. You, you're a science writer. You explain things lucidly that are, you know, factual. But you always bring this sort of uh, openness to absurdity and delight in ridiculousness. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about matching science and humor, because people are not always willing to read about science, sadly. No, I know. I find that. Uh, Humor, humor is a way uh, I found, and it wasn't intentional, but it's a way, just a way for me um, to, to pull an audience into a topic that maybe they didn't intend to read about or didn't know they had any interest in, whether that's, you know, post-mortem careers of cadavers or um, things in the military. And they're not things that, that, that scream humor, <laughs> but I, I find there, there's always humor uh, humor is everywhere, and often um, humor is a way of, of coping and a way of um, relating. I mean, everybody. I, I mean, it's a way of touching people, and so I. Um, but it, it, you have to you have to be careful. The humor can't be at the expense of the people that you're talking to or the people in the book. I mean, for the most part, it, the humor is directed at myself being, you know. Um, out of my element, uh, a bumbling fool, <laughs> um, or, or else just sometimes the absurdity of the scenario, like finding myself at the Pope's compost heap, not having intended to be there. Um, there's always, there are always moments, even if a topic doesn't lend itself naturally or obviously to humor. And, and I think it's, um, um, for me, it's, it's, I enjoy, I enjoy the challenge of, of, um, doing humor in a way that's that works I mean it that is subtle enough um there's nothing worse than humor that doesn't work that's that's off key and that's where my editor uh is incredibly valuable she will sometimes there'll be a couple paragraphs and a scene and and Jill will just cross it out <laughs> and write no <laughs> uh, and she's always right and um it, that's very helpful to have that um, check on and, and uh, you know it's sometimes I can't quite I can't quite hear it or recognize it you know maybe I was there and it was funny but on the page it's not funny or it's just a little bit there's maybe some meanness to it that I didn't intend and that's not good um, anyway he, he was a it's a complicated thing but it's it's been good to me I think it's a great tool to overcome science phobia Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. I'm kind of the gateway drug to science for people, <laughs> you know, people who didn't necessarily mean to end up in the science section of the bookstore. They're, 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 um, they're, they're gonna, it, it, it pulls people in and then they realize they don't even realize they're reading about science and suddenly they're going, Hey, this is interesting. This is science. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it does have that wonderful effect. It does, and you know, what we're all talking about is story. You know, that you draw people in by telling stories. And, you know, Gloria, as in your collection of short stories, 
each one is a universe. And as you were talking about the form and how rich it is, um, I thought I'd ask you to kind of call out some of the other new, newer writers that our audience may not yet be familiar with uh, that's in your anthology. I mean, you have some um, traditional writers we all cherish, but how about some of the new voices you've included? Yeah, um, like Sam mentioned, Alexia Authors is one of my favorite, favorite writers. She's so incredible. Um, she is, her background, she went to Iowa and she her first book was um, entitled How to Love in Jamaican, which is a, a great title. You know, I had so many people like, is this like a romance book? Like, what is this? But it was a collection of just like A plus short stories that pulled you completely in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Camille Acker is also a great new voice who she was published on Feminist Press. Her book was entitled um, Training School for Negro Girls. And it took place, a lot of the stories took place in the Washington DC region where I'm originally from. I grew up in the Washington DC area. So there was also just like a heart pull for me there because I recognize a lot of the landmarks and just even the, um, the slang that the young people were using, you know, it reminded me of my experiences in high school. Um, and as you mentioned, it's, it's a mix of, you know, newer contemporary writers and then uh, older classics that a lot of people will recognize, like Jamaican Kincaid or Toni Morrison, um, Paul Marshall. And I also want to note that this is an exploration of Black girlhood, but there are threads of stories um, of Black women. So you can see their evolution from young girls to uh, more sure and assertive women. So there's um, an excerpt from uh, the great Gwendolyn Brooks and her story um, is, is very reflective of a young woman who's just you know, she's a newlywed, you know, and what that transition from being a single person to be a, being partnered, what that looks like and what that feels like. Um, and so many people are familiar with Gwendolyn Brooks because of, her, because of her poetry, but she also did novellas and beautiful short stories that I, I just cherish. So there, there's, there's so much. I, um, another uh, more contemporary author is uh, the author Dana Johnson. Um, and I, love her story it's entitled Melvin in the sixth grade and it's just like talks about this young girl who's new to this town in southern California and she falls for this just like you know off kilter unexpected young man and what that relationship looks like and young, young romance and how it can be just like awkward but feels so all encompassing, you know, your first crush or your first like, you know, sixth grade romance, you know, what that feels like. Um, and she is just an incredible writer. She teaches out in, um, in California. She's a professor at USC and um, she's written so many incredible stories. So these voices all come together really beautifully to show these different aspects of youth and growing. Um, and yeah, I think, I think they're, for, for me, I'm just like, I I took so much care in picking each story that I, I hope people feel that and see the connections. And at the end of each story, I also included discussion questions because I yes. wanted there to be um, it's a book club kind of feel. And this is always a little bit of a debate, you know, if, if, if you should have a short story collection as a book club read. And I'm like, yes, do it, you know, break <laughs> the norm. You know, you can hop around. And I am definitely a, a nonlinear reader. So I can, I don't know if I could say this out loud, but I, I do chop, hop around. I like, I can start from the beginning and I go to the end and come back. Like, I think it's okay. There's no rules on how to read a short story collection do what feels best to you uh, and you can read it for your book club pick and i hope that is the case so people will read it for their book club or just for on the beach or on their subway ride and really kind of take a, a deep breath to understand who the writers are and uh explore the old and the new voices because they're they're equally just like so profound and wonderful you are the ideal anthologist. <laughs> That's Thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Short story collections, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Glory. Um, so uh, Sam, listening to uh, Glory talk about her collection about um, black girls and girlhood and you know being African American in America, and I'm thinking about you writing about a Chinese American family in the Midwest. And I'm wondering if 
when you were writing the family tale, was that during the last year or so when we've seen such extremes and let me just say misunderstanding about uh, people of Asian American background? Yes. Actual I, hate crimes, of course. Yes. I did finish the book in the fall of 2020 and I found it really, I mean, I did find myself again, thinking more about my father because he had just passed away and how much yeah. it would have um, saddened him to see everything that was happening in Wisconsin and how I was sort of glad that he died before the things that happened in Wisconsin were happening because they were happening in the same um, part of town. I mean, part of the state that we're from. Um, and, you know, he, um, the, the book that I'm writing does have a lot of elements of it in which the characters, particularly the three boys who were born in America can sort of have to deal with um, misperceptions about them and about their culture and about their families, as well as like actual um, sort of, you know, being bullied and um, beaten up. And there's a lot of that in their, in particularly in the story of the middle brother Ming, who um, for whatever reason, it could have just been his personality um, or the way he was so serious and so good in school, got bullied a lot more than the, his older or younger brother. And that this, this childhood experience of his becomes a really powerful um, sort of inspiration for him to grow up and become successful, so successful that nobody could argue that he had basically beaten everybody who ever heard him. <laughs> and it, it actually is, it's, a, it's a, a scar that he has that I think limits him. Um, he's a very limited character, especially uh, toward the beginning of the book. Um, but he ends up uh, by the end of the book, kind of understanding what he went through a lot more clearly and um, the self-hate that he feels as a result of what happened to him when he was young changes somewhat. Um, so I, I was exploring these issues. I started the book 15 years ago and really I, I was exploring the issues particularly about Ming throughout. Um, but the, the, the whole idea of the community voice also comes into play because uh, the community itself becomes involved in the story at some point. And you, you know, you can see the characters begin to see ways in which the community in which they live, um, uh, it accepts them, people eat at the restaurant, but on some level they don't accept them, they don't understand them. And when there's a, eventually, a, I don't want to give away too much, but there's a trial about the death of the um, one of the main characters that becomes um, this, these issues come up in, the, in, in public. So yeah, I, I do think that the book, more than any book I've written, um, deals with these issues head on. And I think that one of the reasons I was able to write about him, write about them is that I just decided I wanted to take on like a larger palette uh, in terms of tone, voice, uh, story, plot, like the whole thing just feels to me like a larger, um, just a larger picture than in my other books. Um, yeah, I, I will, I, I want to put in one more plug for short stories. I think they're a great book club idea. Yeah. Oh, you're the best, Sam. And no, I, I do. Wait, wait to like read your book. I think like right now I'm actually reading um, Crying in H Mart. And I, you, you use the word palette. And I think that's just like using food, like food as a metaphor of like love and togetherness and like showing just like diversity and the richness of culture is just so, it's such a beautiful device. I'm so excited. Just like listening to you, like talk about it and the humor and same thing with you, Mary, like Buzz sounds like so awesome. Like I, I and, and you just naturally like are a funny, like very vivacious person. Like I can see how that energy is gonna come across in your book too. It's, I'm excited for both. Like, yes, book club for all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. So Mary, to wrap it up, we just have a couple more minutes. 
Um, so you read a lot. I see your shelves. Um, is there, do you read fiction at all? And if so, do you want to name some favorite authors? Oh, gosh. I actually read um, more fiction than nonfiction. I don't know if I'm supposed to admit that. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I, I, some of these books are um, my husband's books as well. But um, um, yeah, right now I'm just, I'm reading. Well, we go, to, there's this bookstore, uh, Friends of the Oakland Public Library, which is, it supports the Oakland Public Library. And so we always, you know, when you're done reading, sometimes bring them there, but also um, they, they have books, wonderful books for sale for like between two and $5. So we come home with these massive piles of, of books it's sort of you know taking them there and bringing them back um so and they they're not often new books they're often you know books that i haven't that i you know missed first time around um like i just last night finished a book by patricia marks that who's just very she's very funny uh it's a novel uh she used to write for saturday night live she's more of mm -hmm. as a new yorker um Nonfiction writer, so I was curious to see what uh, her novel is about. But it was uh, it was it's a very entertaining, very funny sort of story of her. I mean, I think it's probably based on her past relationships that she uh, had when she was at Cambridge and then in New York. But um, uh, so it's you know that one was that one's a lot of fun. I have um, one thing on on Goodreads. I list the book. I only rate books that I loved. So anybody who, you know, there's hundreds of them on there, but um, anybody who wants to see sort of what, um, what I've loved, they're, um, they're on there. Uh, all my, uh, all my favorites. I, I don't, I don't even know where to begin with, <laughs> like to name one or two. <laughs> I totally sympathize. Uh, but I love that we've confirmed that you're a fiction reader. And uh, yes, that's really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, it, it, it's telling stories that matters the most. And, you know, we talked about humor as a way to approach difficult subjects and just any captivating story and any captivating characters. And Mary, you're always a captivating character in your book. So you uh, welcome us in that way, too. I was going to say the one I read just before that was a uh, Accordion Crimes, Annie Prue, who's Ooh. another author uh, that uh, I adore. And, I, uh, and she's interesting to me because I think she does more research for her fiction than I do for my nonfiction. And if you read her acknowledgments, it's like, and I thank this person for explaining how windmills in the Midwest are put together, you know, and this person for the uh, whether what the different types of accordions and how they're assembled with, you know, kid glove leather. And you know, she's um and I think that's something that's always fascinating to me, the amount of research that does go into to, to nonfiction so that the details are real and and you don't trip over that you know something being kind of off uh, and um, anyway so that was the one before the Patricia Marks book. Oh, Annie, please, that that makes further back I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, really. And you'll keep thinking of them. So yes. <laughs> well, that this has been so wonderful. Thank you, Sam, Glory, and Mary for this fantastic conversation and for your wonderful presentations. Very excited about your book and. Um, to be continued, I think, yes. Now I have a uh, business to do. And let's see, where are we? Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Sam, Gloria, and Mary for taking the time to speak with us. It's been such a pleasure tomorrow. Thank you. And I hope everyone's enjoyed thank it. You so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks. Tomorrow, all the attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation. The title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like that you see here, including, may I please plug the Carnegie Medal for Excellence presentation next week, June 24th. We're so excited to have our winners accepting their award. Um, did you know that there's still time to register for ALA Annual? And please register. It's going to be fantastic. It's taking place in just two days between June 23rd and June 29th. This year's conference will feature truly incredible speakers like former President Barack Obama, need I say more, educational programming and an opportunity to connect with colleagues and librarians everywhere. Visit us at uh, 2021.alaannual.org for, no for more details.
And let me plug book list, my beloved home away from home, not yet a subscriber. Here the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. Lock in your print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer for only $75. Magazines just continuing, gets better all the time. Lots of news on book list front, stay tuned. Thank you for joining us for today's wonderful conversational webinar. One more huge thank you to our extraordinary panelists, Lon Samantha Chang, Glory Edom, and Mary Roach, and of course, our sponsor, WW Norton and Company. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.